right, take your hymn books, page 150 tonight. 150. We're going to do a non Christmas song. 150, He Lives. We're going to do a resurrection song. How about that? Page 150, let's stand if you would. Page 150. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. 150. Here we go on the first. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to uh, come into your presence. Father, thank you for these folks who have come out on a Sunday evening. And uh, Lord, thank you for the reason, for the season, your son Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for uh, the miracle of the incarnation uh, when God became man. And uh, so thankful, Lord, for, uh, for that, Lord. And Father, I pray tonight you'll bless as we look to the book of Revelation. Uh, Father, bless our time. May it be pleasing to thee, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. On the third verse now. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who see Him. The help of all who find. The mother is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. Along life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to him. You ask me how I know he lives. He that tonight say amen amen good to have a few non-atheists here tonight amen all right good to have you here this evening well good to have you here i always hope the sunday night doesn't thin out after i people get excited like let me i want to hear about the book of revelation then i teach it no that's okay they'll come back i know where a few of them are but nevertheless good to have you here this evening and uh, excited about, uh, I think we started off December real well this morning, amen? Had good services, I think. Great, great sermon. There's no pride there at all. I'm just saying it was a great sermon. Uh, Monica, did you like it? Did you quote it to your husband all the way here? I didn't think so, no, because he doesn't have any issues with pride, does he? No, 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 he's machismo, so no, no pride at all. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, um, it's great to see all the Christmas lights up. and all. How many of you put Christmas lights up? Raise your hand real quick. All right, yeah, me too. 
Yeah, me too. By the way, if, if you need your Christmas lights put up and you're lazy, Rob will do it. Right, Rob? Rob will do it. That's a Christmas lights extravaganza. Amen? He will put up your Christmas lights for you. All right. Well, listen, let me give you just a few quick announcements here. Uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, we, we will not have our regular evening service as we normally do. Uh, so we're going to, uh, for one week, uh, we'll take our secular questions, scriptural answer uh, that we've been doing, and move it one more Wednesday away. Uh, but this, co this coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., uh, we will have uh, the Lighthouse Preschool Academy's Christmas play right here in the sanctuary. And again, that is 6.30 p.m. And how long do you think that's going to go, Miss Aragon? That thing's going to go for an hour and a half? How often can we hear a bunch of kids singing Feliz Navidad for like, how, how long are they going to do that? Okay. Is there going to be snacks and stuff like that afterwards? There, is that, I mean, is it, is it free for me to say that? <laughs> well, I asked you guys about it last week. Is, is, are we going to do that or not? Okay, we're not. We're not having snacks. So as soon as it's done, leave. Okay, we're not. But if there are snacks, you're great. All right? So what's this hour and a half thing, Christine? No, no, we got to get in here quick because the governor is going to find out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just not worried about that. All right, anyway, 630 for those of you who want to, to be here and see that, a little early Christmas festivities. And then December 20th is not Christmas morning, but it's our Christmas morning service, okay? So uh, December 20th in the morning, we'll have some uh, wonderful Christmas music. Of course, all through the month of December, we'll have Christmas music, except for tonight. We changed it up a little bit. But um, we'll have Christmas music, Christmas service, Christmas sermon, I think. Might preach on hell that morning, you never know. But uh, there'll be no evening service on the 20th, and then we're going to gather back here on the 24th, Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m., invite a friend for our Christmas Eve candlelight services. That'll go for about 40 to 45 minutes or so. And then January 3rd, keep, mark your calendar. It's a brand new year. Hopefully it's a better year. I don't know. We'll see. But um, the January 3rd, creationist Russ Miller uh, will be speaking at 9.15, which is our Sunday school hour, 10.30 a.m., which is our worship morning hour, and then, of course, 5 p.m., which, of course, is our, our preaching and teaching hour. Uh, but invite your evolutionist friends, people that struggle with the whole Genesis account. Hey, can it really be true? Uh, Brother Russ is really good and adept at helping some folks understand that out. And uh, even had a, a good uh, uh, chime in from... Uh, uh, Lucy Velotsky this morning. Uh, she said she said that uh, uh, she's going to put that down on her calendar, and she's always kind of struggled with that. I says, well, come on out. So, uh, Lord willing, and I'm also going to invite uh, our council member here, Jason Gibbs, and a few others, and just to see if we can get some of these higher ups coming in. So we'll see what happens. Uh, it'd be great to see people like Jason Gibbs yeah. confess their confess their uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, and represent us at the same time. Uh, other than that, uh, I don't think there's anything else I need to mention, uh, but I do know that there are some ladies here that were present yesterday at the Ladies Fellowship, so I'm going to ask one of our deacons who's got an open microphone that I'm sure is hot and heavy. That's right, look at him right over there, looking dapper, just a haircut, wearing a sweater and a jacket. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, isn't it? It is. Amen. All right, who's, which lady was at the fellowship yesterday that wants to give a quick testimony? We'll go to Monica Zarate. Um, yeah, we had a wonderful time at the Ladies Fellowship, just getting to know each other better and listening to everyone. We all got a chance to speak and tell a little bit about each of us so we get to know each other better. And it was a great blessing, and Erica is a great host. So it's, she's been a blessing, and all the ladies have been a blessing. Fourteen ladies. My husband went Christmas shopping. 
Yes. Um, he disappeared. With he 14 women in the same house, I would have gone Christmas shopping <laughs> in July. Alfonso, where did you go? Where? It went down the valley? Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Trying to get away from it all. I can understand that. All right. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Well, I'm glad that, uh, that you uh, had a good time shopping, and thank you, Sister Erica, for hosting that. Thank you. Any other lady want to give a quick... Uh, uh, Tim was going to raise his hand, but he wasn't at the fellowship, but go ahead, Tim. This is, this is not a fellowship one. Yeah. I just want to thank the, our church for being uh, hospitable to the new people who came today. Lots of, there were quite a few of them, and they felt so w welcomed and warm, and it's been like a drought for them. They haven't been to church, they haven't been here, they haven't been there, and so uh, we are uh, very much, uh, you know, in their minds, we were very uh, warm and, and, and welcoming to them. So I'm just trying to take my daughter seriously. I'm sorry, she walked in. <coughs> Why doesn't your wife wear those glasses instead? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who gave her that stuff? Is that you, Robin? That's you, the one wearing the necktie. That's, all right, that's good. All right, that's great. Um, I, I do know that the lady that sat over here, Trisha, there it is right there. I, I don't know why that's so hard for me. Um, she has, I, I, she's coming back. There's no doubt about that. We had a good conversation today. And um, she came out of a Word of Faith church. Uh, which means, you know, speak your miracle and, uh, you know, sow a seed and then get back, you know, a hundredfold, even though, even though the preacher is in a jet and you're still driving in a VW. But nevertheless, um, for 15 years, she was in a Word of Faith church. And so uh, she started, she just literally in the last year came out of that. Amen. And so uh, uh, wanted to find something that was, um, she said, fundamental. And she said, King James. And I says, well, that's us. I don't know how much more us that could be. So um, we're excited about her and, and the potential of these two other folks that came in from Silmar and uh, down in the valley there as well. So we'll see. If... Well, the governor says you can't. They did. Yes, they did. They did. We were all stuck in that room singing. I'm excited about our choir number on the 20th. You're going to hear a good choir number on the 20th. You're going to hear a great choir number on the on Christmas Eve, and you're going to hear a great choir number on the morning that Russ is here. So we got choir, 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 amen. All right, who else got another quick praise? Or I'll call you, because that's the kind of guy I am. No? Give one to my wife. Give a mic to my wife. She needs to talk a little bit. Yes, dear, talk good for you. Well, my daughter's harassing me with Robin's stuff. Yeah. Well, I thank the Lord for my salvation, and um, yesterday was, was really a blessing. We've had uh, some ladies who haven't come before, We um, and so it was, it was a nice group of ladies, and it was a wonderful time of fellowship, and it's a great time to um, just get out of the world and um, just give each other's testimony, no where everybody's come from and what's happened to them this past year and it uh, definitely creates a bond and so um, it's really it's really nice and it's really a blessing amongst ladies to be able to, to have that so I'm thankful for everyone who made it and uh, was a part of it and um, thank you Erica for just organizing it <laughs> um, Robin gave her that yeah for organizing it and opening up her home and um, just even sending out invitations to the ladies and um, just going up to almost probably more than half the church and inviting everybody personally. So um, it's just a, a blessing that someone has stepped up in the church. To, I can't to wait that. till you invite them up to Acton. <laughs> All right. What's that? No, I just go to the back and be with a horse. Maybe go shoot some quail. All right, who else got another quick, uh, at least one more. Oh, Dennis, way in the back there, uh, Ron. Ron, 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 Ron. I did trouble today. I praise God that the ladies were able to get together and fellowship and really get to know each other better. But I do ask that uh, they come back to the church because I always enjoy tasting their treats before their meeting when I bring them their drinks. 
Very but, good. But thank you, Erica. Touche. For taking away my for taking away my meal on Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. All right. I don't think there's a uh, oh. Hermano, Jose. Yeah, I'm just grateful for, for uh, God's love for us. Um, he answers prayers. Got a uh, Christmas card from Pastor Preston this week. Amen. And the little insert where they detail their trip going east and certain things that happened. Their uh, RV broke down. They have to come <laughs> back. And this is on the onset of the uh, corona thing and all that. So you think, okay, now we got to pay for repairs. But God's plan was to bring them back home and keep them from, you know, getting exposed to a bunch of things out, you know, on the trip. And this goes to my daughter. Uh, a couple of weeks back, her boyfriend came to visit from Arizona. Unknowingly, his mom had tested positive. Came to visit and uh, went back to Arizona two days later on a Sunday. And my daughter was kind of, you know, upset to find out that his mom had tested positive and he lives with them. Mm -hmm. So she tested, uh, came back negative. He had symptoms. And she tested again uh, and came back negative, which, you know, I praise God for that. Yeah. And I know Monica was praying a whole lot for her, too. You know, it's just that uh, God takes care of us uh, unknown, you know, to us in different ways. Amen. You might think, you know, well, you know, it should have been this. But Father knows best, you know, and I praise him for everything he does for us, everything that he gives us, all that we have. Amen. You know, and I don't think there's enough prayer and, and, and thankfulness to appreciate what it does for us. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Almost sounds like a testimony that should have been given last month, but it's a testimony that can be given every month. Amen. It, it, if you want to. You got a credit card? Let's go. All right, let's go. Because I just don't want to go get socks. So, um, We did help Brother Preston out with some of, the, some of those uh, RV issues back in the early part of the year. Because uh, he called me, he knows who to call, and so uh, we helped him out with a with some with some money on that. And uh, uh, let me also just say this in passing, as we as we're going to Revelation chapter one in your Bible, um, I did get um, some of us know who Paul Chapel is up at Lancaster Baptist. Some of us don't, uh, but um, you know we have a little bit of a love hate relationship. But nevertheless, he's a brother in Christ. There's no, there's no other way around that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is. Um, his mom passed away uh, about a week or so ago, uh, Maxine Chapel. I've known her and Larry, his dad, for 40 years. And uh, Maxine actually taught at Pioneer Baptist uh, School when I was attending there uh, briefly. And, uh, and then uh, he found out uh, as he was there doing the funeral that he uh, contracted the coronavirus. So he's actually at, uh, at home mending and I sent him a text today and he just said, hey, this thing's a little tougher than I thought, and so he's, uh, he's going through it. So uh, just pray for uh, Paul Chapel if it would come across your lips, Brother Sherlock. Yes, exactly. All right. Revelation chapter 1 tonight. Only a handful are going to understand that one. Giraffe. Uh, Revelation chapter 1 <laughs> and verse number 12. We ended at verse 11 last week where it talks about the, the seven churches that chapters 2 and chapter 3 is going to be all about. Um, and you'll notice that we're going to actually finish chapter 1 today, and you're probably thinking, that's pretty amazing. Uh, it actually is, because uh, this whole section needs to be exposited together. Uh, it really can't be cut up in pieces. I guess we could, but I don't think it would be fair to the text. Uh, so in verse 11, everyone there say Amen. All right, in verse 11, we've got the Alpha and the Omega, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to John, what you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. And he mentions them, Ephesus down through Laodicea. And we'll have a lot to say about those seven churches when we get to those two chapters uh, starting uh, next Sunday night. Uh, but uh, verse number 12, I want you to see something very interesting here. It says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, 
And, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, let's just stop for just a quick second here and think about a few things. The Lord Jesus Christ just got done speaking to John. Can we all agree? And in verse 12, when John turns around, the first thing that the Lord Jesus Christ wants John to see are the seven golden candlesticks. Now, you say, well, what are the seven golden candlesticks? Here's the good thing. I don't have to tell you what they are. You don't have to guess what they are. God's Word will interpret itself. Look at verse number 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So each candlestick represents one of these seven churches. Everyone got it? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to look to your word. And Father, we pray now that, Lord, you would help us to focus the next few moments, Lord, upon your word. Help us, Lord, to filter out the filth and the ridiculousness of the world. And Father, for the next 30 minutes or so, Lord, help us to focus on what you'd have for us tonight. For it's in Jesus Christ's name and all of God's people said. Amen. All right, now listen, if one doubts that the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, then verses 12 through 19 should put an end to this discussion. Here in the first chapter, we find John describing the voice which spake unto him. But pay special close attention. When John turned, he first saw seven golden candlesticks and then Christ in the midst of of his churches. Now why is this? I mean if, and I want you to think about the the miraculousness of this. On our way to church today, uh, to this evening, we were coming down the hill there uh, on the 14 just descending from the Agua Dulce area and uh, Derek was asking about, hey can we see the sun and keep staring at it? I says, if you keep staring at it, you can only successfully stare at it one time then you just don't stare anymore. It, you don't see anymore. It's just not good to stare at the sun, amen? There's something about the sun that you just can't look at it for a long period of time. I want you to notice this descriptor of Christ in the midst of the church. He says in verse 13, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, which is an Old Testament derivation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's clothed with a garment down to the foot. He's girt about the paps, which would be his midsection, with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, so he doesn't look like a 33-year-old Jew here, uh, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a what? A fire and his feet like undefined brass, that's gonna shine, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And I want you to notice verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, that is his persona, was as the sun shineth in his strength. As I was telling Derek on the way down this evening, you can't look at the sun a very long time or it'll start affecting your eyes. Jesus Christ is in the midst of these churches, these seven golden candlesticks, and he's so bright that the Holy Ghost must have carefully let John see only the candlesticks. Because how could you miss the one who's in the midst? That's right. So again, why is this? Why, when John turns, does the Holy Spirit of God have John focus on the candlesticks as opposed, at least initially, to the one in the midst? Well, the truth is apparent. Christ 
is made clear and Christ is focused through his churches. Amen. I'm going to say something to you, and you can get all mad if you want. You can't have a successful walk without an assembly. Right. Let's all r rattle our heads so I can hear it. Yes, you cannot be a lone ranger Christian and think that Christ is going to be in focus all the time. It is important and imperative that God has placed a shepherd, an under-shepherd, an earthly shepherd in your life who is, well, the guy who kind of steers and gears the flock. And I think it's important to understand that, that you can have a Christian walk, but I think that it's important that you understand also that it's better with an assembly. It's much better. Christ is made clear and is seen through his churches. Christian, is the church you're attending making much of Christ? Is Jesus Christ the sum and the substance of the church where you attend? If he is, then Christ will be in the midst of that church. If Christ is not, and that church is not doing its due diligence, Christ can now remove that candlestick from the presence. And you say, what does that mean? Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse number 5. He says to the church at Ephesus, which is the first letter of these seven churches, he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, here's what's good about that. That isn't saying you've lost anything. What he's saying there is that you lose the ability to be a church. Now, I want you to listen to me closely. Don't turn me off and, and, and don't think that I'm being mean about other groups. Not every church is a church. Now, listen. When that candlestick is removed, that means that that institution on earth, which we call the church, which Christ instituted, Amen. if that institution is not faithfully proclaiming and is faithfully rooting out false doctrine in their own midst, which these seven churches have some false doctrine. Yeah, one church is letting a woman named Jezebel teach a bunch of heresy. Yeah. There's one church over here that's getting, you know, getting fancy with the Baalites over here and the Nicolaitans, and we'll get into all those groups when we get into those chapters. But just know that these churches have got, at least six of these churches have got some doctrinal issues. So if a church is not making much of Christ, proclaiming Christ, and is not rooting out false issues in their church, then Christ looks at that and says, you have failed to meet the criteria of what a church is, so I'm removing your candlestick. You've ceased to become a church. That's the way I look at that. Now you say, well, what's another way to look at that? Well, you can say that you've lost it, which I don't think that, well, that's, what, that's what it means. Let me put it to you this way. Do you really honestly think that thing over in Rome is a church? I mean, honest to goodness, when we get to Revelation 17 and 2050, yeah. you didn't catch that, did you? When we get to Revelation 17, at some point down the road, you are going to be convinced that Rome is an infiltrator, not a religion. I'm telling you, that thing is not a church. However, however, if Satan is going to imitate something, he's going to do it through that thing. Right. And, it, and Satan has been a grand imitator from the garden until now, until he throw, he's thrown into the lake of fire. Right. He's always imitating or trying to closely resemble that which is Christ's. Right. 
And when we get there, we're going to see those things. So I want you to understand that when John hears this voice that is speaking to him about writing these letters to seven churches, the Holy Ghost of God arrests John's attention on the churches and then sees Christ in the midst of them. Now listen, if a church is not preaching and teaching doctrine, then it has no claim to being a church. Now let me explain that to you. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. First thing out the gate, doctrine. There is, for, that's 1 Timothy 3.16. There is no way that a church can effectively be a church where Christ is in the midst, that's, that the candlestick is there, if it is not teaching and contending for doctrine. And when something false comes into the assembly, it is up to the pastor and leadership of that church to root and fester that thing out before it gets worse. We've had that happen in our assembly in 18 years. We've got an escapee right here from it right here tonight. Amen? So. But the fact of the matter is, when, let me put it to you this way. When you're in a Bible-believing church and you've been in one for a long time and somebody comes up and says something that's a little off, your little scripture perceptors kind of go, hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> huh, maybe I should talk to him before I judge him. I'll ask him what he means by that. Maybe he can clarify. But when somebody says to you, well... The Holy Spirit does not indwell the believer. He only indwells the assembly when we're corporately gathering. You have to understand that that is somebody who is giving a private interpretation to the scriptures. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that the, that the, the scripture is of no private interpretation. In other words, you're not supposed to just take the scripture and go, I understand what it's saying, but here's my interpretation of what that's saying. I don't care what your interpretation is. What does it say? I'm not concerned about what that guy's interpretation is or what that guy's interpretation is. I'm concerned with what does it say. That's all I'm concerned about. You see, this thing about interpretation is a red herring to go debate and debate and debate. I just want to know what does it say. Once we figure out what it says, then you can go ahead and entertain what you might think it is. But the fact of the matter is, usually what it says is pretty clear. I like Mark Twain's quote. It's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that worry me. It's the things in the Bible that I do understand that worry me. And there's far more in the scriptures that you understand. But here in... Revelation chapter 1, John turns and sees the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Notice the thought is not done. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Wow. Consider this description of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of his churches. Verse 13. It says, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Look up here. He's modest. He's a modest Savior. By the way, I've got no problem pointing that out. And I think there's a reason the Holy Ghost put that in there. To let you know that it's good to be modest. Now remember, when that Old Testament priest in the Old Testament walked up those steps to minister as the high priest... He was supposed to have a garment all the way down to the foot. That's right. You say, why? Because God did not want any flesh yes. showing as you're worshiping. Yes. Look up here. I wonder if the modern church even understands that. 
the, 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 the fundamental churches got hung up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s on dress, dress, dress. And I understand why they did, because there were so many people in the 60s. Yeah. They came from poodle skirts to hike them up. Come on. Some of you were in the 60s and wore them. Oh, it's Sandra. That's right. And boots up to here, you know? And, and in the 60s and 70s, those churches got, hook, got, got hooked on that, and they just kept preaching on that and kept preaching on that. But they lost the focus thinking that all we need, as I said this morning, was just a new dress or a new suit on every man or every woman. No, we need a new man and a new woman in every dress and every suit. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, they got so hooked up on that that all they became known for was, oh, that's the church down there that takes a ruler and measures the woman's skirt to make sure that it's six inches below your knee. And, and, and I'm not saying that all of that was bad. I'm just saying that some of it turned into a cultic mentality. It just got a little nuts, okay? I'm all for modesty. Look at this verse, verse 13. One like a son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about with paps with a golden girdle. That's his midsection. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. Brass in the Bible is a type or a picture of judgment, and it's clear that there's judgment here, because when he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives, judgment's going to happen. And he says, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Uh, the only thing close that I can even get to is Niagara Falls. Some of you have been to Niagara Falls and have been close enough to where you've got to go like this. Pretty nice looking falls, huh? Yep. Say why? The, the, many waters falling. And that's the descriptor that, is, the descriptor that is given here. His voice is as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. I wonder what that is. I wonder what that is. Amen. It's the same two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth in Revelation 19. Right. And then it says this, And his countenance, that is his appearance, was as the sun shineth in his strength. That descriptor is an awesome descriptor. That's right. The description that you're getting there is not of the 33-year-old Jew that died in 33 A.D., with, with brownish hair and, and, and olive-toned skin. Um, the description that you're getting here is what the Old Testament calls the Ancient of Days. You say, where is that? Keep your finger in Revelation. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. The descriptor that you're getting here is somebody who has been through it. Daniel 7 and verse number 9 says this. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. That is something underneath him. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. You say, what was that? Oh, probably a sword out of his mouth. Thousands, thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. What you're getting a description there in Revelation chapter 1 is what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7, which is the Ancient of Days, Jehovah God, in all of his radiance, in all of his beauty, and in all of his righteousness. And may I say to you that I believe that John... Peter and James saw the same thing in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Amen. If you remember, Peter, James, and John were taken up apart from the other 12, and they were able to see Jesus Christ transfigure into the former glory that he held before he took on flesh. Then I want you to notice verse number 17. There's only one reaction you can have 
when you see something that has been described as you see in verses 13 and 17. And the description is this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now look up here. He didn't fall back like the Pentecostal churches. Come on. He didn't fall back. No apostle, no friend of Christ ever fell back. Now the foes of Christ, they fall back. But the friends of Christ, they always fall forward in complete and utter adoration of what they see. John's reaction to this high and lifted up revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus did not, uh, John did not high five Christ. John didn't say, what's up? John reacted as any child of God should react when you are in the presence of 100% holiness and 100% righteousness. You bow in awe. There's only one reaction to that. You say, you want to see that in the Old Testament? Sure, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, show you the same picture, just a different view. Isaiah's view of it. Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord lift, uh, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Now listen, uh, for the past several months, we've all been getting on the Trump train. But everybody needs to get on the Jesus train, amen? amen? His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had, by the way, seraphims have wings. Angels don't. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, or with two of them, he covered his face. And with the other two, he covered his feet. And with the other two, they did fly. You say, six wings? Yeah! That's a weird looking creature, amen? Right. One of these days, you'll be able to see one. When one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy. You say, why three? One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. Is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried. You say, why? Because it's a voice of many waters. And the house was filled with smoke. And it wasn't Marlboro 100. Verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. You say, what happened? Isaiah got to see a picture of himself while looking in the mirror of Jesus Christ. Listen, man, these guys that get on these religious channels and say, I went up to heaven and I saw this and I saw that and I was up there hooping and hollering with Jesus, that guy's a fool. He don't know what he's talking about. You say, how can you say that with any kind of uh, authority? I got a book. Amen. You look at every time Moses only got to see a shadow. And he had to be hid in the cliff of the rock in order to survive that. Amen. You just don't die and go to heaven for about 30 minutes and hoop and holler with Jesus and get on your surfboard and hang 10 with him. No! You get into the presence of Jesus, man, I guarantee you, you're on your face and you're bowing. And there's no other way for you to react. This notion of, well, you know, he's my best friend. And by the way, he is my best friend. And he should be your best friend. But there should be a healthy fear. I'll give you another one. You say, how can you fear and love him at the same time? The same way you feared and loved your dad. Come on. I, I love my dad. But there were moments when I feared him. There were moments when I feared him. You say, why? He had an irrational anger. <laughs> that would sometimes explode like Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> and if you got in the way of the lava, then you got burned. But that doesn't mean I didn't love him. Now, if you can do that with your earthly father, why can't you do that with your heavenly father? Amen. Amen. Back to Revelation chapter 1. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now let me say something to you real quick. If you're a believer and you get into God's presence, there's nothing to fear. 
He said, but wait a minute. But I've se- I understand all that. I understand all that. But there's nothing to fear. Look at verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Okay, now here we, here we go. Verse number 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. All right. Do you remember back in the first time we, we assembled for this study? Yes. I said that it's important that you rightly divide things. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, here, the Lord Jesus Christ divides it out for you. He says to John, he says, Write the things which thou hast seen, past, and the things which are, at the moment John's writing, and the things which shall be hereafter, which is everything he's seeing in the future. All right? So that means chapters 1 through 3 in your Bible, Revelation 1 through 3, is the past. Why? Why? It's already happened. Revelation 4 through 19 is the present, things which are from John's perspective. And then Revelation 20 through 22 is the future, things which shall be hereafter. There's your breakdown. 1 through 3, the past, has seen. Revelation 4 through 19, present, things which are. Revelation 20 through 22, future, things which shall be hereafter. Now you say, why is that important? Because that's going to help you divide the whole thing. It's going to help you divide the whole thing. You know what's funny? I didn't even have to divide it for you. Jesus divided it for you. It's real simple. Now, look at verse 20. And we'll be done here. Look at that. 10 to 6. What a grace. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Now, we know what the seven golden candlesticks are. They're the churches. And he says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, your guess is as good as mine. I guess we can now go into interpretation. Amen? Um, The closest thing I've ever got to something that sounds halfway decent about who those seven stars are is that every church that is a church has an angel representing it in heaven. There's an angel that represents the Freedom's Way body. Why not? I'm not saying that's so. I'm just saying that's the best argument I've read on this argument. And and there's an angel that represents, and they're in Christ's hand. Okay? So if a church does not perform its duties as a church, that is, they're not teaching doctrine, and they're not rooting out false issues, and they're not soul winning, and they're not, you know, all the things that a church should be doing... God looks at that angel and says, what's going on with your church? He says, now, now, now get, them, get them in order before I remove the candlestick. Now, I don't know if all that's true, but it's about as good as anything else I've ever heard on the subject, amen? Now, if you've got a, you got a take on that, that's great. But all I, could, I heard people say, well, the candlesticks are the pastors. That's good. Well, that's great. Problem is, I'm not in his right hand. I'm actually, in, I'm actually in his body. I'm not his right hand. You ever thought about that? I'm not in his right hand. I'm part of his body. You ever read Ephesians chapter 5? I'm bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So I'm not in his hand. I am his hand. Will that help you on eternal security? I want you to think about this. How many of you ever heard of progressive revelation? What that is... It doesn't mean progressive Democrats. Say amen. All right. Progressive revelation. In John chapter 10, we all use this for eternal security. Jesus has us in his hand. And then the Father who's greater has Jesus in his hand. And who in the world can get us out of that? Well, that's great. But by the time you get into the New Testament, because that wasn't New Testament, by the time you get it, John 10's not New Testament. By the time you get to the New Testament, I am now bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. How do you get out of that? Come on, let's hear the rattle. See how it progressed? 
Prior to the cross, I'm in his hand, which implies I might be able to wiggle out. But in the New Testament, I'm in his body. You say, well, that means a local church. Well, this is a picture of it. But his body's seated at the right hand of the Father. And I'm in that thing. Amen, preacher. All right, look at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. All right? I want you to notice one word here in verse 20. Mystery. Mystery. Now, why in the world would Jesus Christ call the church a mystery when we're in it right now and it's not a mystery? I want you to think about something. In the Old Testament, there was no church. There was the assembly in the wilderness. It's a type of the church. They were called out of Egypt, all those things. We've gone through that. Ran through the waters of baptism via the Red Sea, all that stuff. We've covered all that, types, pictures. But in the Old Testament, they had a nation, and that nation had a covenant with God, Israel. You don't even get to the word New Testament. The word New Testament doesn't even show up in your Bible until Matthew 26. You say, what's there? That's him with the disciples in the upper room instituting the Lord's table. And he says, this is the New Testament in my blood. When he sheds his blood, now you have the death of the testator and now you get into the New Testament. Before that, there isn't a church. You see a picture of it. But on this side of the cross, now there's a church. There's something that is incorporated into his body. Now you say, give me an example of what you mean by that, preacher. Well, I want you to think about this. All the Old Testament saints in the Old Testament saw Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as the king on the throne of David from Israel. That's how they all saw him. The Old Testament prophet only saw from mountain peak to mountain peak. The valleys in between remained a mystery to them. If you're on, I went up to the top of this thing up here today, and I looked down this way, and there's a lot of castake you can see. But what's interesting is you, what you see is just one mountainside to one top of the mountainside to the other top of the mountainside to the other top of the mountainside, and there's a whole lot of valleys I don't see. A whole lot of them. The Old Testament saint saw from where he was to Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as king over Rome and everything. And that's what he's expecting. That's why the Jew asked the question in Acts chapter 1, okay, now that you wasted time on this whole thing about crucifixion, wilt thou at this time set up the kingdom? You say, why? Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a kingdom. There's a whole valley here. You say, what's the valley? It's the church. It's a parenthetical insert. You say, you're telling me that um, the Old Testament saint didn't know about it? I'm, I'm telling you they didn't. Take your Bible and go to Ephesians. Ephesians. Just go there. I'll find it when I get there. <laughs> All right, here we go. Verse number 1 of chapter 3. We'll go to Colossians in just a second. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard that of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, Whereby, when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, translated Old Testament, 
was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And what is that thing? That the Gentiles, non-Jews, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. Then he says in verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. You say, what was Paul saying? He says it here and he says in Colossians chapter 1 that there was a mystery that no one knew in the Old Testament. Christ kept it hid. When Jesus Christ died, He instituted the New Testament and now we're not under an Abrahamic covenant, we're under the covenant of the New Testament, which is through His blood. And you say, what happens there? Well, I when I get saved, I become part of His body, but that's not enough. I've got to find a body down here that best resembles that thing. Right? right? Yeah. Now, let me give you an example of that. Let me tell you how this is a picture of that body sitting at the right hand of the Father. Two times a year, three times a year, we assemble and we gather leaven, unleavened bread and grape juice. Is that really his body and blood? No. Then it's a picture. That's right. So is this. That's right. All right, when you get baptized, is that your salvation? No, no it's a picture. Yeah. All right, so is this. Right. So is this. It's not the real thing. You say, what do you mean it's not the real thing? I mean, what I'm saying is, when I die, do I cease to be part of the church? No, now I'm really in it. Now I'm really in it, not just the picture. Just when I break out my wallet, you know, and I say, here's, a, here's, a, here's my wife. And the guy says, no, that's not a wife. That's not your wife. That's a picture of her. That's true. It's just a picture. This is a picture. Remember my sermon from last week about body, soul, and spirit? I'm not really looking at the real you. The real you is under you. <laughs> All right. A little too much for tonight, amen? Now, let me, uh, let me end it by saying this. Now, here's what's the interesting part. I want you to get this. And if you miss it, I'm sorry. The entire New Testament is about Paul revealing the mystery. So why, when we get to Revelation, does it go back to being a mystery? You know why? For the same reason why there was no church in the Old Testament. Because God's dealing with Israel. Yeah. And it's a different covenant. Amen. And this is gone yeah. and goes back to a mystery. Amen. And we're done tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. And Father we're, uh, Father, we're thankful for the clarity of your word. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you would, uh, Father, uh, continue to bless these studies. Lord, I know they're a little heavy. They're a little, uh, we go down deep, but we try to come back with a little bit of something. Uh, but Father, uh, it's a study. I mean, we, we're studying to show ourselves approved. And uh, Father, I pray tonight that, Lord, uh, you'd help us to have some uh, information in our minds that would be helpful. And bring us back safely. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you need notes, believe me, all what I said is not in here. But if you need them, they're right here.